Welcome to Novelist Spotlight. This is Mike Consul, your host. In addition to being the host of this podcast and interviewing novelists, I am a novelist myself. I have three published novels. My latest is titled Lolita Firestone, a supernatural novel, and it is set in Sedona, Arizona and Cairo, Egypt. My previous novel is titled Family Recipes, a novel about Italian culture, Catholic guilt, and the culinary crime of the century. And my first novel is named Hardwood, a novel about college basketball and other games young men play. And that story deals with issues ranging from depression and racism to sex, religion, and university politics. All three novels are listed in the episode notes. I hope you will buy them, I hope you will read them, and I hope you will thoroughly enjoy them. Now, on with our program. This is Mike Consul, your host. In the spotlight is Kate Manning, the author of the critically acclaimed novels My Notorious Life and White Girl. The New York Times called My Notorious Life an action-packed, thought-provoking page-turner. O Magazine called it daring and astonishingly current. National Public Radio's Kurt Anderson, host of Studio 360, said it's a fantastic yarn, absolutely Dickensian. And novelist Marissa Silver writes, Axie Muldoon is as fierce and alive a character as I have read in recent fiction. My Notorious Life is an essential novel for our time. And, uh, you know, Kate, uh, welcome to the program. And that is some very high praise. Uh, that That's... <laughs> That's, well, what can I say? It's just very high praise from some important places. Congratulations on My Notorious Life, and uh, and welcome to the program. Thank you, Mike. Thanks a lot. It's, um, you know, it's it's really nice to hear those words from people that I respect a lot um, after working for a long, long time in the dark and, you know, never knowing if a book would be published. So it's, it's great to... Uh, to hear that. And thank you for your introduction. It's great yes. to be on the spotlight. Yes. You know, um, I have to say that I, I haven't read all, all of your stuff, but I've read enough to see that what you do, there are people who write good stories and, you know, good storylines tend to be kind of a dime a dozen, but to write a good storyline, get critical acclaim because of the beauty of the writing Mm-hmm. is uh, the creativity of the writing. You're in that space. I mean, I can see that very clearly. And when you see a writer who pays a lot of attention sentence by sentence to what he or she is saying, it it, it really it really shows. It just it lifts off the page. Tell me, though, about My Notorious Life. You have another novel named White Girl, which I had mentioned. You have another one called Gilded Mountain. So this is number three. Where does that, in terms of where does it rank in terms of of the three novels that you have written, either in qualitative terms or the birthing process? What could you say about it that uh, my notorious life vis-a-vis your other work? That's a really interesting question because um, I guess to me, when I pick up a book, a novel, I I look for a strong, strong voice, you know, kind of a narrator who is going to grab you by the throat and say, I have a story for you. So listen up. Um, and it's hard to find a voice like that that's distinctive in a sort of the modern middle class white woman uh, vernacular and, and the kind of the way I talk. Um, and so I was looking for a strong voice and I wondered where I might find something that was interesting and unusual. And I looked in the past and that was really what got me started. I, I found um uh, a story of a young girl who was one of the many 30,000 orphans on the streets of New York. And, and I discovered the orphan trains, which was a story I'd never heard of. And once I got this scrappy uh, young girl on the train, I, I wanted to get her back to New York because I was writing about the city. And I, I stumbled on the story of a midwife and an abortionist who practiced in the city for many years, uh, tr- the true story. And I'd never heard of her either. And, you know, after some deliberation, I, I, this, this young girl grows up to borrow some of the history of Madame Restel. And so for me, the voice was 
the most important because it was quite liberating to write in this um, Irish American 1800s vocabulary with lots of slang. And I love the English language. It's so um, full of borrowed words from from many other languages, and it's it it was a real celebration for me of getting getting to play around with that. You know, you mentioned voice, <clears throat> and writers can spend their entire careers trying to find their voice. Now, in your case, do you look to establish a voice that is a consistent voice throughout your writing? For instance, if I was to pick up any reader was to pick up with novel number four or novel number one, they would say, that's Kate Manning. I recognize her and she's, there's an intimacy there. Or, I mean, just based on what you said, it sounds like you had to adapt, uh, uh, adapt a different voice or adopt a different voice for My Notorious Life. I, I don't know. I, I can't tell you whether people would find it consistent across the work. Maybe some of the sense of humor certainly would be there, but I I used to, in college, I did a lot of acting. And so I feel as if you find a character and then you try to adopt that character's mannerisms and patterns of speech and rhythms. And that's what helps you um, make a character distinct. So I, I really can't say whether whether they're consistent, but... Um, I do think a strong voice is is finding one is really akin to acting and channeling the personality of your narrator or narrators. Now, you lose a lot of sleep because of your writing, don't you? I heard you say I'm a terrible sleeper. So <laughs> is your head always at work? Uh, is the are the characters, the situations always incubating in your head, even as you put your head on the pillow? And, and is that the reason why your sleep is so spotty? I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe you can uh, psychoanalyze me here, but I think that's right. I think for so many writers, um, it's a blessing and a curse because one, I'm never bored. I am always, you know, imagining that something is other than what it is and, and living in, a, in a story or an alternate reality. Um, but yes, yeah, I think a lot of times my best ideas come to me at two o'clock in the morning and I have to get up and write them down. And often when I look at them later, they're terrible, but <laughs> sometimes yeah, it's, I, it, yeah, it can see it, it, brilliant in the moment. And then that's the thing is, is, uh, starlight sleep is an altered state of consciousness mm -hmm. and the things that we fear. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times I've been, um, laying in bed and worrying about something. And then when I got up in the morning, I'm like, what was I worried about? That was exactly. ridiculous. Yeah. Do your characters ever come to you in your sleep? Um, I don't know. A, I don't yeah, know if ahead. they come to me then, but that's a good question. I find that one of the best times for writing is very early in the morning and, and I do wake up early. I think you're still sort of in a dream state and less inhibited and you're not watching yourself with that third eye of self-consciousness. And so the um, you're f more free to um, pour things out and and then you can fix them later, which is a you lot know, of <laughs> a lot of that. I talk about being less inhibited because what I see with writers, and I don't know if this is going to be true with you, is your first novel is much less inhibited than after the, than the subsequent novels. I, I'll give you an example. Tom Robbins said, that he didn't feel like he really wrote a novel until he wrote Jitterbug Perfume. But some mm -hmm. of those early novels, like Another Roadside Attraction, um, was a better ride to me because he wasn't so concentrated on, on putting structuring a traditional novel. Do you feel that, you're, like, for instance, White Girl, which I have up on the screen right now, I'm just taking a look at, at mm -hmm. some of the writing, and um, it's it's shows a, a real sense of freedom, I think. Do you hmm. think you were more free with your writing then than you were with My Notorious Life? Or do you feel that, uh, that that's not necessarily the case? I don't know. I think, you know, with my first novel, I, I didn't know how to write a novel. I'd never written a novel before. I didn't even know if I had permission or standing to write the not write a novel. But you know, as it came out on the page, it felt 
it felt exciting and and I thought maybe this is a real book. Um, are you talking about White Girl? Or are you talking about yeah, the first novel? Mm-hmm. It, it it you know it, it felt a little bit frightening, um, perhaps because of the subject matter too. But um, you know, just in in the, the the second novel I wrote actually never got published because I was I think more inhibited. You know, I I knew what it took to publish a book, and so I was more maybe more self conscious. And then when that book wasn't published, I just sort of thought, well, maybe I should be a teacher. Maybe I should give this up, but I couldn't give it up. And I just kept going and I kept having fun with this strange voice on the page of, of Axie Muldoon, the narrator of my notorious life. And, and I, so I don't know. Writers you couldn't give up that book or you couldn't give up writing or are you talking I couldn't about give up writing? I couldn't give up. Tell writing. me why, why can't you give up writing? Not that I'm suggesting you do that or anybody would suggest that, but there's obviously something uh, that uh, ties you in a very emotional way to the writing. Well, writing is really, really difficult. Writing is, as you know, is is not, you know, you don't just sit out, sit down and type out what the stuff in your head. And so I think if you're, I think people who do it, so, you know, many people, and I'm one of them are just compelled to do it. And um, I grew up in a household of painters, you know, my mother and grandmother and uncle, we all were, were painters. And it seems to be a a, com- a compelling urge to describe the world or to get it down somehow and explain it or else it just just to convey that sense of what you've seen and heard and felt in a story or a, an image. Now, you say visual images fuel your writing. Uh, talk about that a little bit. How do you feed that? Do you literally seek out visual imagery to uh, maybe even as a ritual before sitting down to write? Where do you access visual images or is it more just happenstance? Um, well, with um, my notorious life, I was I just happened to be looking at pictures that, of the pictures of Jacob Rees, who documented he wrote How the Other Half Lives. And he documented these homeless uh, waifs on the streets of Manhattan. And, and there was one that was just riveting, you know, of a little girl, probably seven years old with a baby on her lap. And she just looked fierce. And knowing what I knew, I, I just thought, well, what was she like? And what was life like for her? And, and same with, um, with my new novel, Gilded Mountain, which is set in 1900s Colorado. Um, that one was prompted by finding an old photograph in my family's attic. It's an it's a long sepia tinted panorama of a hundred people standing in front of a mountain range, and I didn't know why it was in our attic. And when I asked my dad about it, he didn't know much. He just said, "I think one of those guys is my grandfather, meaning my great grandfather." And he, I didn't know much about him, but I think he had something to do with quarrying the marble for the Lincoln Memorial. So I didn't, I I said, what, you know, why didn't we know that? And he said, I, I you know, I don't know much about him. So when I set out to find a, a story, um, I found this small town in Colorado and a lot of images of workers toiling in a in a quarry with this beautiful white stone and um i just wondered about the lives of the women and found some great stories of a really uh, strong newspaper editor a woman who who uh, suffered severe consequences for speaking out against the marble company and um, and so a lot of these became ingredients for the the story storyline. Now you also you said your mother, your uncle, uh, I think grandfather all painted. You also paint, Kate? I I painted. I mean, I I played around with paints and drawing in college. But after that, I maybe I just decided to to. I mean, I was just wordier than artists. A lot of artists are are. Uh, strictly visual, although my family <laughs> rather verbal too. Right, right. Now you've been doing book signings, of course, to promote your books. Talk about book signings. What to, could, what can you tell us about 
what you hear from the people who come to visit you to get a book signed? Uh, what do you what do you look to accomplish during those, or what do people tell you? Uh, you just pick your shot here. I'm just curious what book signings are about. And is this just something, hey, it's a necessary thing that I need to do because I'm trying to promote my career? Or do you actually look forward to them? I think I think I look forward to them. I mean, it's so you you stay alone with your with your book, your story, your characters for so long. These books have taken me five, eight, 10 years to write. And so to meet readers and to meet booksellers who are enthusiastic and who've read your story and want to ask you questions about it is really gratifying. And I'm so grateful to independent booksellers in particular all over the country who press a book into a reader's hands and say, you'll like this one, this one, if you like this, you're going to like that. And it's not an algorithm. It's not some Mm -hmm. number thing in a, in a computer that's it's real people saying I read this and I think I know you and you'll like it so it's yeah. fun for me to talk about the characters and and the history especially is stuff that I didn't know I'm constantly finding a story and saying how come I didn't know this and it's so fascinating and important why didn't I know about the labor movement and and this you know, Mother Jones and and her her fierce advocacy for workers. Um, if I'm interested in this, I think other people will be too. You don't just write for entertainment. You write to deliver information. You write to maybe um, help ameliorate some wrongs out there in society and so on. I mean, with white girl, you're married to a black man. Milo. Milo yeah. loves me. I believe this. I'm reading from your book. Mm-hmm. He loves me. He always said more than he loved himself, more than he loved screwing or skiing oh. deep powder or <laughs> drinking dark cognac, loved me despite mm-hmm. her. I believe that. In mm-hmm. his jail cell where mm-hmm. he is now, he writes to me, Charlotte, please, please. Mm-hmm. He well, wants me to come to see him. Yeah. And and yeah. it goes on from there. But it's uh, I well, wanted to read a little bit of that just because you really kind of get that sense. And then I'm leading to a question as well. But you get that sense, the freedom in the writing, the uh, also just entanglement. There's entanglement there. There's another woman. He's mm-hmm. in jail. He's black. You're white. That alone creates conflicts with uh people who are not part even part of the relationship in many cases did you ever date or be or marry a black man no i uh, dated yes but not married no did you um, need to do sp- uh, any particular research for this or are human relations such that you don't feel like it's really uh, that that relationships are relationships in whatever size or color well both i think that um we we know now, we especially know now that book was written after the OJ Simpson trial. So it was back in the 90s. Um, I think we know more and more now about who has standing to write a story and uh, what is necessary to write f- out of points of view and observation. And so I have many, many shelves of many books and had many, many conversations with uh, friends and couples, and um, I I think that those conversations are really important, and those books are important to write from all points of view, and it's important to do it right, to do it with respect, and to do it from an informed point of view, um, and not... We have seen authors who write about a subject, and they get excoriated by Mm -hmm. readers who say you have no business writing this stuff you're not you're not asian you're or you're not black or you're not a female Um, and there is there is this uh you know kind of this expectation that you need well either to be part of that tribe or to uh clear some pretty big hurdles to be taking as taken as legitimate i think that what's really exciting about our time right now is that there's been so much 
pressure to include voices that have been excluded for a long, long time. And that is all to the good. And it's a situation that's evolving and um and I'm I'm really so delighted to see books and novels uh, by people who have been left out of the conversation, and there's plenty of room for all of it. And so that really delights me. I mean, when I was um, when when I was writing my notorious life, for example, as I said, that you know, this was a history of a birth control pioneer who had been excoriated in her time and, you know, made a lot of headlines and was basically hounded to suicide by a right-wing religious zealot named Anthony Comstock. And so I think that I write to educate myself in a lot of ways. This was not, you know, same with Gilded Mountain. Um, I did not know very much about our labor history. I didn't know what our ancestors went through in the mines and factories and what it took to get labor laws that gave people the right to strike, that gave people employment protections. And so if you saturate yourself in information and write out of a sense of of hope and inspiration and and um, but mostly storytelling, you know, not to lecture, not to deliver a big history lesson, but just to tell what it's like on a human level. Right. Keep it in art form as well. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, during your book signings, I suppose you probably do a reading or two. Is that right? You do some reading? Yeah, I do a little bit. I, I think sometimes readings can go on too long. I usually I have a great slideshow that I love to um, you know, that, that sort of tells, uh, about the people, places and events that. Oh, that, interesting. Um, Tell us about that. So, so it's basically kind of a, um, a visual depiction. You said the people and places that, that you're really writing about. Sure. So for example, in Gilded Mountain, um, you know, I, I saw this picture of, uh, women and children in deep snow, standing outside shacks in at 9,000 feet of altitude in Colorado. And, and um, so I can show that picture. I can show pictures of the marble mine, which is this vast white cave with men working in tangles of wire and machinery. I can show pictures of um, workers shoveling a snowy railroad track where the snow is probably 14 feet deep. And they they have to shovel the track in order to get the stone down the mountain. Um, I can show pictures of the newspaper office where this woman editor was writing about, you know, labor movements and strikes. And there was a big manor house uh, up in the mountains of Colorado that I used to um, as a stand in for the, the manor house in the story owned by a coal baron and his wife, who was said to be a European countess. And so there are pictures of them. And, um, you know, into the story, as I was doing research, <laughs> I, found, I found a picture of um, King Leopold, who was this Belgian despot who did really hideous things in the Congo. But he, the, the, the tourist brochure I saw, it said, oh, King Leopold slept here, you know, as if it was George Washington or some great character who had stayed in this place. And, and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, they didn't say anything about his atrocities. And I didn't know whether I should put him in the novel, but it was too good a chance to pass up. And so he has a cameo. <laughs> he makes a cameo <laughs> in Gilded Mountain. And, you know, then, and then because he walked in, I discovered Deerfield, Colorado, which was a utopian community founded by African Americans trying to escape lynching, which was rampant in those days. And so, you know, Deerfield is there because uh, when you're writing about a marble quarry, you, you, you ultimately address questions of you know who we honor in history, monuments, and 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 things like that. So, mm. 
Deerfield was this mm. utopian place and it's very, you know, it's a real, it was a real place. So that's in the book too. It's really interesting, Kate, uh, all of it, including the use of, you know, a slideshow at the book signings. When you do read, what do you look to select? Do you select the same uh, tract of copy each time or do you play to the audience? What do you choose to read to them? I usually actually have always, I guess I often go to the first paragraph, the first page of the book, partly because when I write, I I try to write a, a, a hook, a line that will um, grab somebody and, and sort of set the story up. Maybe that's my background as a television producer, you know, to tease the, the upcoming story. But um, so I usually read the first page because it contains elements of the story to come without giving anything away, really. That's what I usually do. So let me ask you why you write. Uh, well, I understand. Uh, actually, let me re rephrase the question. What I'm asking you is what are the psychic or emotional rewards of writing in your case? You obviously are, you need to write. You're, it's one of those things that uh, it's like breathing to you. But, mm -hmm. but after the work, not uh, after the, the day's work or after the month's work, what is the psychic or emotional rewards that you, that you glean from it? I think it's really a, a privilege and a luxury to get to tell stories and to write stories. Um, so I find it, exciting. I find it um, moving. It's a way to always keep learning and to perfect a means of expression and, and, and really just tell a story. I think that's, that's what I enjoy doing. So um, psychically, I don't think I've ever thought of it that way. It's just who I am. <laughs> Well, let's say somebody meets you, they find out you're a novelist, never read any of your work. Now, you're not a genre writer, but if they were to say to you, what is your subject matter as a writer, what would your reply be? I think I like salvaging um, stories of people who I haven't seen on the page in my many years of reading. So I, I sometimes quote um, Virginia Woolf, who said, uh, there's a girl behind the counter too. And I just as soon have her true history as the 150th life of Napoleon or the 70th biography of Keats. And so if you want to tell a woman's story um, and, and I'm hungry to know what it was like in the past and what it's like now for us in this, in this time, you, you have to look uh, in the shadows and read between the lines and find someone's diary and then make up the rest. It's, it's an act of imagination. That's what, what I is. Would... Gotcha. Well, what would you say has been the biggest frustration of your career? Mm. Um, I, I, I guess it's that it takes me so long. I have three kids. I have um, elderly parents. I, I am always, uh, you know, pulled away from my work by life in general, as as are most writers. And so it's that divided life where you, you could be on vacation, but you're on vacation and you think, oh, I should be working. So I've skipped a lot of vacations and let the family go off without me. Um, but is it frustrating? I think I think that's what it is, you know, um, just to to be dropped, pulled away just when I get going, you know, just when I have a, a chunk of days and then, and then something will pull me, pull me away from the work. When I worked as a journalist um, or when I write nonfiction, I can write on a train. I could write, you know, in a, in a moving car with dogs barking. It, it doesn't bother me because it's a different kind of thinking. But to make stuff up or to imagine things, I really need my decks to be clear and to have no distractions. Yeah. Hard. Hard. Yeah. I can tell you, anybody who's, who writes nonfiction and then tries to write fiction just decides, well, let's write a novel. I think they are 
shocked by how difficult it is, by how different it is. Even Tom Wolf, the great mm-hmm. Tom Wolf, decided, well, I'm going to write, you know, I'm, I'm, here I am famous for my nonfiction writing and the new journalism. And uh, he said he was, he plunged into despair when he was writing the bonfire of the vanities uh, because he, it just wasn't the same. It took him quite a while before he, and in fact, it took him, I think 10 years, 10, 11 years to write it. it that, that was usually a timeline on, on each of his uh, novels. It was about 10, 11 years. So yeah, it's uh it's, it's a major change of, of, of course or thinking. So I understand for totally what you're talking about. For me, for me, I probably had the opposite problem because when I was a journalist or when I was working in television, I was always thinking, oh gosh, it'd be so much better if you said it this way or you did that. Or if what if this happened? That would make it much better story. And so <laughs> it's not really a good quality in a journalist. <laughs> well, I'm sure you stayed between the lines. <laughs> I did, I did. Do you have any obsessions? Is there something that obsesses you? Oh gosh. Um I guess I guess language, you know, I um kindness, especially these days. I I I am very concerned at the tenor of our times with when people um use language as weapons and and ban books and um accuse each other of all kinds of things without listening without conversation and so um sometimes you feel that being a novelist is kind of pointless i mean considering the huge issues that confront us but also if that's if you're lucky enough to have a platform and a, a way to say something about kindness and injustice or community, then then you're lucky to do it. So yeah, and you know, always remember that uh, writers who live in totalitarian societies write stories that actually get the message out there, and it's the only way to do it, and it's done with enough subtlety that. It doesn't get the censors after them, but at the same time, the people, who, the thinking people out there who read read those novels, uh, they get the message. They understand, and it's it, it adds value uh, for for sure. What was a turning point in your writing life? Did you reach a point where you knew um, that I'm doing the right thing, or did you have a breakthrough along the way that you would consider your turning point? A couple of things. I mean, I think when you get encouragement from teachers uh, or from other readers or people that you respect, then it keeps you going. You know, there have been a couple of things along the way that uh, uh, have kept me going. And so a turning point, you know, I, I moved around a lot as a kid. And, and so that means you're constantly making, trying to make new friends and uh, and, and when you don't have any friends, my, my mom was, was a great storyteller and she said, well, you know, write it down here, tell it, put it in a story. And so I was always, I think I was always a writer from the time I was very young. Mm-hmm. Um, but did I believe I could be a real writer? I don't know. I didn't, I don't think I did. I it was, it was something I did in secret until, you know, through journalism and a couple of classes that I stumbled into, in college, I thought, well, maybe I, I could really do this quote for real, you know? Yes. What is the greatest, uh, whether real or apocryphal, what's the greatest compliment received from a reader? Hmm. Uh, gosh. Well, recently, the great writer Anna Quinlan, unprompted by me, <laughs> um, uh, shouted out how much she loved Gilded Mountain and she had also loved My Notorious Life. And I, t- I took that as a great endorsement because she's a, a voracious reader, a fine writer, a great judge of character. And so I, I lived off of that and am living off of it. Wow. Time, right? Yes. Understandable. Mm-hmm. Is, is there a single author out there who is your biggest influence? No, I wouldn't say a single. I mean, I think I, if you, 
if I were made of books, I, I would be made of many, many great writers. Um, yeah, Harriet the Spy, Grimm's Fairy Tales, uh, um, Faulkner, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, Toni Morrison, uh, and lots of new writers coming along that are it's very exciting to read. So I guess, you know, when I was a little kid, <laughs> and people would say, oh, I'm so full, I can't eat another bite. I really thought that that when you ate, your your food started filling you up at your toes and filled you all the way up to your head. <laughs> and I, I sort of feel like that about books, you know, like, but I still have room for a lot more books. I still read as much as I can. I love that you brought up Harriet the Spy because I read that when I was a kid and I literally started carrying a notebook and a pen around with me. Yes, yes. It was such a, it, I mean, it just showed me early on that I certainly had a desire to observe and to write. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> yeah, just a great story. I, you're the only author I've heard bring it up. I, I think you might be the only person in my life I've heard bring up Harriet the Spy. That's fantastic. Oh yeah, Louise Fitzhugh has created a lot of writers, my own daughter included. She she carried a notebook around for for years too, and and has um, landed uh, as a writer herself. So, what gets you high when you're writing? Oh, just a, it, most of it is really a. It's really like laying tile a lot of times. Um, the best times are when you when you just have a, a great page or a great paragraph and the rest of the time really you're telling the story or laying it down and then you're going over it and over it and over it and cutting and cutting and changing and fixing and polishing and you know many 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 drafts and I tend to write a, a section and then fix it and fix it. And when it feels like it's got some momentum, I write another one and I just, you know, keep pushing through the fog to get to the end. It takes a long time. It's a lot of hard work. Do you ever write under the influence of anything? No, I don't. I'm a very, I'm a straight arrow. What is your writing regimen when you're full throttle working on a novel? What is your regimen like? If I'm having a great day, I get up at six in the morning, I'd get a cup of coffee, I let my dog out, um, and I get that, I sit that butt down in the chair and I work, <laughs> you know, and I try not to get distracted and I try not to check email or anything. And I, if I'm, if I'm feeling distractible, I'll set a timer and work in 20 minute increments and just say nothing. You can't do anything until that timer goes off. And then another 20 minutes and another 20 minutes. And I'm only really good until, you know, 12 or one or two. And then I, you know, I'm, but that's, I'm, that's six or eight hours right there. Yeah. That's yeah. and writing is, is an, and you know, for anybody who has, has never written, uh, doesn't understand how exacting a, a a process it is it takes a lot of energy to write so that that's a good long stretch there if you can if you can get it done yeah but don't you just sometimes feel i know i do oh well what did you do today well i think i moved a comma <laughs> <laughs> i, think I, ripped I up everything i did yesterday and <laughs> I come a little bit more from the Julia Cameron school where it's you know you just get some words on the page you know lay track and uh, even if you're going to throw it away, you just have to keep it moving now. But then there's also the rewriting process, which, yeah, I could see that's obviously a slower process uh, if you've got something that's already been somewhat vetted and you're working with it. Now, would you write every day during during the good times when you are in high productivity mode? Yeah, I think I always, always think like, OK, uh, it's January. So the school vacations are over and the holidays are over. So I'll. I'll January and February should be good months. And, you know, and I think the decks are relatively clear, um, but I tend to rewrite as I'm going because I'll, I'll just not, I don't feel the story has momentum. And that's probably what takes me so long. 
Plus, you forget, you know, what color eyes did that guy have and how old is he and how old is the baby? And <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I make side notes sometimes. I have the name of each of the character and then I continue to add some notes mm -hmm. so that I don't try to identify an eye color a second time or get, or get that wrong. I know, I know exactly what you mean, because mm -hmm. there's so many there's there's just so much copy that you're working with once you get halfway through a piece of work. Yeah. It's easy to lose track. So um, any rituals that you observe for writing, anything that you do that's, that kind of sets the table for you? Obviously, you get your cup of coffee, but I don't know whether there's uh, anything ritualistic that kind of sets the mood or puts you in a certain frame of mind. Besides tearing my hair out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Opening the window and um, watching the New Yorkers go by walking their dogs. No, I don't, I don't really have any, um, any charms or uh, spells that I, that I know. I don't have those. Maybe I should, you know, any good ones. Let me know. You know, I talked to uh, one writer. I don't know if this is a ritual, but she created a uh, soundtrack. She picked mm -hmm. songs that she felt were inspirational for writing. And I'm not sure if she just listened to that to get herself energized and in the mood, or she would actually listen while writing. Can you listen to anything while writing, or do you need it, it to be completely silent? I need it to be completely silent. I do have um, a couple good readers. I want their friends of mine from writers I've known since college. And, and so when I feel that I have something that's not embarrassing, and I'm not quite sure whether it's it's real. I'll I'll send it to them, and they'll say nah, <laughs> or they'll say, you know what, this has got something here. Keep going, and and I trust them. So, um, but I know they won't because I know they won't be too cruel, and um, we'll have really smart feedback. Right. So that's important, I think, for for you to have. Do what. To what degree do you outline uh, the book, Kate, versus allowing it to be organic? Um, once I have a beginning and an ending, I guess as I go along, I kind of have vague ideas of things that I want to have in there, like, oh, well, I'll need a chapter where this happens and this is supposed to happen. So I have vague, uh, a vague list of chapters. And once I you know, I'll say, okay, so this has to happen next and this has to happen next. So uh, more or less uh, vague chapter, chapter lists. What do you consider to be the strongest part of your writing game? I mean, M. R. Leonard, they used to say that the guy writes dialogue like he invented it. For you, is it creating characters is it is it dialogue is it mood is it pacing what do you think is is your number one strength as a writer i think i like i hope i hope somebody would agree with it but i guess if i were to hope it would be uh capturing a very this very specific detail and metaphor and 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 in a way, in a way to carry emotion without overt description of it. I don't like it when, you know, writers revert to language of, I don't know, cliche. So finding a mm. new way to say something, uh, getting getting a detail that carries emotion for you is something I strive to do. Um, and I, I could only explain that by, you know, finding an example, which I don't have at my fingertips, but I like metaphor and simile and, and language and rhythm of sentence structure. But, but I believe plot is and character equally important. So all of those, mm -hmm. I hope I get them right. Yeah. You know, it, it is amazing how, even with professional novelists, how often common phrases and cliches are there. And you think, why wouldn't they have made an effort to go back and, mm. and come up with a either some fresh wording or, as you say, you know, a, a metaphor, a 
a simile, something that just um, takes it into a, a different place. T talk about the uh, proxy project. This oh. is a get out the vote effort that you're part of, trying to get young people to get out and vote. Young people are not, um, they, don't, they don't vote in high percentages. Uh, and yet so much of what's going on, they're going to be living with for maybe a good long time. What is the, uh, what can you tell us about why you're uh, working on that project? And maybe you have the answer as to why so many young people are, don't actually get to the polls. I think there's a lot of answers for that, but I'll tell you, it started in 2018 with a friend of mine, um, Susan Addis Stone, who uh, was part of the impetus to get a woman on the $20 bill to get a woman on the money. And that's what led to Harriet Tubman um, being voted to be on the $20 bill. And so she ran women on 20s. And we were talking about the midterm elections coming up. And this was when um, the Parkland shooting happened in Florida. And the students there were so smart and so activated and so vocal and so mobilized. And yet they couldn't vote. They were in high school and they were dying for, they were dying and they were dying for their adults and representatives to do something about this violence. And we thought this is the perfect time for high school students and others who don't have that voice to say, I can't vote, but you can. So do it for me. So be my proxy at the polls and I will, you know, I'll just, just get you to the polls. And so we had this, this idea that it would be kind of a matching set up. So a high school student or uh, an immigrant, you know, a dreamer would say, I can't vote, but do it for me to their neighbor or uh, their older brother in college and motivate them to, to do it. And so um, we worked on this, this for uh, up until the election, I guess, I can't remember exactly the dates, but we got a, um, teams in schools in 35 states and we um, we really thought it was a very good model. But as you say, it was hard to get kids motivated. A lot of them, you know, uh, in terms of absentee ballots, they didn't even know how to get a stamp because they were so used to email so there were a lot of obstacles. And what we realized is that voting and participation in a democracy is about civics, a civic education and what it means to be a citizen. And so we got this um, just before the pandemic, uh, a series of schools called the um, Democracy Prep Public Schools. Uh, adopted the proxy project as a platform. And so we turned it over to them in hopes that they would perfect it and get their high school students, which were involved in, in a civics education to, to use it. And they have done it, but the pandemic kind of got in the way. Um, and I still have hopes. We still have hopes for it as a good model for educating students to understand what a ballot is, what how what it means to register to help. Because a lot of kids are like, I'm 18, but nobody ever told me how to vote. I don't know how to do this. And I'm scared of it. And do I have to walk in? And so particularly for disenfranchised people, uh, it's an important lesson. And that was what motivated us to do it. You know, I just saw David Hogue on the on one of the news channels yesterday. He's Probably the major activist that came out of that Parkland shooting, or at least he, he's been the most uh, upfront in, in the media and mm -hmm. um, um, an impressive kid is, mm -hmm. and he continues to work at it. Um, let me ask you about, you were a creative writing instructor at Bard High School. Mm -hmm. um, wait, it's called Bard High School Early College. Is that right? Mm -hmm. In yeah. Manhattan. Yeah. Talk, talk about teaching creative writing. What are, because there are people who believe, well, you can't teach creative writing. You can't really teach writing. People either have it, their brain works that way or it doesn't. But um, obviously there's people who are looking to be more creative with their writing. What are some of the elements uh, or suggestions that you made to your students that uh, to, to try to 
amp up the creativity. Well, uh, yeah, I'll I'll talk about that in one second, but I'll quickly give a shout out to the Bard Early College High Schools. Um, uh, Bard College uh, has these these early college high schools in Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, Cleveland, New Orleans, uh, Newark, and soon the Bronx and and some other places. The model is that a lot of kids are bored by high school and that many, many students are very engaged and challenged by uh, difficult materials, college materials. So if you go to Bard High School, early college, you graduate from high school after 10th grade, and then you begin to take college credits in 11th and 12th. And by the time you get out of what would be 12th grade, you have an associate's degree from Bard. You have two years of college credit, and you can use that to go on to college or go straight into a job. And for many of my students, they were the first generation to have any kind of college degree. They were the first generation Americans. Um, and it's their stories that I found really exciting. So I would have them keep a writer's notebook. I would ask them to write two pages a day. I said, I don't care what you write. Um, you can write what you had for breakfast, but notice things and get down details and get the muscles of your hand moving, the brain connection to your hand and get away from your phone. And so, you know, they would read memoir and novels and I try to give them material that would resonate with them and their lives and languages. And I think, um, you know, we played a game, speaking of cliches, we played a game called Cliche Assassin. And they would <laughs> <laughs> they would bring it cliches and write them on the board. And we would try to think of a different way to say something, you know. That because- sounds great. That was they were they're great students. Their voices are incredible. They all became very good writers, I think. Mostly, um, you know, I would bring in, they would turn in their 20 page papers and I would hand them back and say, okay, I'm handing these back and I'm here's a here's a page of someone in this class. And don't be scared when you see all these X marks and these comments and these lines. And I'm not going to tell you who's this is until the end of the class, and don't be worried. But they all look like this. And so at the end of the class, I would hold, I would say, okay, now I'm going to tell you whose page this is. And they would all tremble. And I'd say, hey, it's mine. This is what I do to myself. Oh, <laughs> you know, wow. You edit. <laughs> Interesting exercise. Yes. I love that system, that Bard High School early college system mm-hmm. you just described sounds great as well. I love that cliche assassin. Wow. That, that's That's great stuff. Now, do you write by hand? I heard you talk talking about, you know, take your pencil or pen, write in that notebook a couple pages a day. Are you a handwriter? I am more and more. I was. And and then um, when I was a journalist, I, you know, wrote on a word processor. And of course, I write on a computer. But a lot of times when I really need to think about something, I sit there with a the pen and paper. And it's much more liberating to do it that way because it doesn't feel like it counts And you can, you know, you write it out and then you type it up and then you fix it. But it's a it's, I think, much more direct, at least for me, uh, uh, connection between um, the work and your brain. I've heard that before. Interesting. Interesting. So, Kate. To the aspiring novelists out there, whether they're just starting out trying to get something completed or they're very early on, what would your advice be to the to the would be or aspiring novelist? First of all, don't do it. <laughs> Second, of all, <laughs> Second of all, if you have to do it, um, well, then do it. Don't just say, oh, I've always had a novel I want to write. We'll sit down and write it and write it again and write it another time and read and read and read and read and and look at the work that you admire and keep it next to you. And when you're first starting, there's nothing wrong with trying to write like that person. If you like Faulkner or if you like Juno Diaz or if you like... um, um, Kylie Reed or vampire novels... Well, look at them, not like a reader, but like a writer and ask yourself, 
how is she doing that? What is she doing here? Break it down, mark up the book and say, okay, well, here Edna O'Brien went from first person to third person. Oh, and here she's going from present tense to past tense. Can I do that? Well, yeah, you can. But look at the way the writer is is working and challenge yourself to um, read like a writer and then do it, do it every day. It's interesting you say that um, <clears throat> it's okay to try to write like Faulkner if that's who mm-hmm. your, your uh, favorite author is or hero <laughs> is. I believe it was uh, Hunter Thompson started off his writing career by opening up Hemingway novels and he would type everything he was reading. He would just yeah. hype yeah. up his novels so that he could understand the cadence of sentences and the pacing of the novel. And interestingly, mm-hmm. Hunter Thompson's writing was a million miles away from what <laughs> from what uh, uh, Ernest Hemingway did. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah. at the same time, he learned to write by imitating somebody who ultimately he made a stark departure from. Uh, but there was the value there. There was the value there in learning writers, the cadence. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of writers do that. And and they 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 um they start out learning by imitating and and practicing that way. I mean, right now there's a lot of uh, young people who write fan fiction. They'll pick a young adult novel they love and they they learn to write by mimicking the the structure of those books. And, so I think it's it's a good thing to do because you you're really only going to ever have your own voice, you know, as long as you're not plagiarizing. Right, right. Well, Kate Manning, congratulations on the success of your books, and thank you so much for coming on the program. And best of luck with all of your future endeavors. Well, thank you, Mike, because you ask wonderful, interesting questions, and um, it's really a privilege to talk to another writer who understands the difficulties and the pleasures and uh, of the work. So thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.